This presentation is called The Third Big Boom, Food Production and Settlement Size. So this is one more piece of the exponential age. I thought I had coined that phrase, but somebody else has already used it. And one piece of that that we started with is the massive human population growth over the last two centuries. We have a fairly flat line and then suddenly this remarkable acceleration in human numbers. And a question that arises is, well, where did the food come from? <clears throat> and this is even more interesting when we observe that during the 20th century, the cultivated area of the world increased only about one third. But the harvest of food during that century increased about six times, 600%. So how did that happen? And the answer is industrial intensification. By the 1950s in the United States, the ratio was one farmer could produce enough food to feed 250 people. So that's what this chart from the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations is showing. Up here in the corner, now that little dot is one farmer and this area in yellow, that's the 250 people being fed. So you'll notice that dot's right about at 250 and we're at the middle of the 20th century. But by the year 2000, that had increased to one farmer feeding 500 people. So industrial agriculture takes what we call intensification, which we see with the shift from horticulture to plow agriculture, for example, to whole new levels. And the result is much more food per unit of land. And to illustrate what I showed there, that doubling since the mid-1950s, in 1970 in Iowa, 86 bushels of corn were produced per acre. We come forward to 2007, it was 180 bushels. And that says bushes, it should say bushels, sorry about that. And this meant that you could start skiing in Iowa. And this gives a whole new meaning to the idea of skiing in Iowa. So American food surpluses are truly enormous. In 2005, we took half of that corn that we produced and we fed it to livestock. So whenever you're eating hamburger or chicken, uh, you're consuming corn indirectly. And then we started turning it into ethanol, and by 2009, we were turning 25% of our corn crop into ethanol. That amounted to about 3% of our gasoline. So if we turned the whole crop into ethanol, it would have been about 12%. This had an enormous impact on people around the world, or it may have been part of that. There was a crisis in grain prices in 2007-2008 which affected the prices of rice and wheat and corn on the world market. And for people living very close to the subsistence level, it put uh, their grains that were basic to their diet beyond their reach. So how is this possible, this massive increase in production? Uh, one obvious part is fossil fuel powered machines that prepare, plant, irrigate, and harvest the crops. But we also use machines to process and package and transport those foods. And we use energy to both cook and to cool them. So this energy revolution is key to the food revolution. And we also apply energy to power the plants themselves. And this is something of a puzzle. How do you turn coal, for example, into corn? This seems like a kind of alchemy. So over here we have our pile of coal and then on the other side we have corn. And can you really do that? Or am I pulling your leg? Well, what you have to put in the center of this is fertilizer and fertilizer takes a massive amount of electricity to produce. 
So the answer is what's called a Haber-Bosch nitrogen synthesis process, which was developed back in the 1930s. This is a book by Vaclav Smil called Enriching the Earth. And Vaclav Smil is my source for much of these lectures. He's written about 20 books on energy. So in the year 2000, fully one-third of the global grain harvest, the main grains globally are corn and rice and wheat, was the direct product of the Haber-Bosch nitrogen synthesis. That was 3% of the world's energy went into producing one-third of the grain crop. And if we've heard this phrase, you are what you eat, um, that's an ammonium <laughs> ammonia tank. So this is the source of that nitrogen enrichment, which is particularly important for corn. And this is actually then turned into the tissues of our body. So beyond the machines, there's higher yield cultigens. And this involves a transformation from artificial selection, which has been going on a long time, to genetic engineering, which is quite novel. Um, higher chemical inputs including both fertilizers and pesticides and growth hormones and antibiotics, so that chemical aspect of the Industrial Revolution. Higher water inputs. In 1900, about 50 million hectares, each hectare is about two and a half acres, were irrigated. That had expanded fivefold by the year 2000. So industrialism displaces human labor from all phases of food production, and it displaces us from rural life. So if we think back again, agriculture is about 10,000 years old, and what we call the countryside was invented during the Holocene. And in traditional agrarian societies, which lasted about 8,000 years, about 80 to 90 percent of the population lived rurally in small villages made up mostly of farmers who were relatively self-sufficient. So this is a fairly long-term pattern in human experience, not as old as uh, hunting and gathering, certainly. But the countryside has come to a resounding end uh, with industrialism. The United States is a post-industrial society, and that simply means we've moved our ind industries overseas. It's not as if we don't depend on industrialism. And about 80% of Americans now live in cities. 2% of Americans live on farms, approximately. And only 1% or less are actually full-time farmers. And the majority of farms out there are lifestyle or hobby farms uh, with a relatively small number aimed at making a profit. Almost nobody in the American countryside is self-sufficient and they're so connected to the grid and to American uh, urban life culturally that we really can't consider it a countryside in any case. So Holocene settlement patterns uh, involved a transition from hunting and gathering camps of five to fifty people to villages of hundreds of people and a few cities with many thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of people in them. Some of these uh, agrarian cities were truly massive. This is a photo of the remnants of the city of Teoshtehuacan in the Valley of Mexico which is estimated to have had a population in the area of about 300,000 people. That's around 300 AD. But if we look at the Valley of Mexico today, we have Mexico City, which has somewhere around 20 million people. And there's actually in 2013, 24 cities in the world now with populations over 20 million. That means half a billion people are living in just 24 cities. And over half of the population in the world lives in cities today. We passed that mark about 2008. So this is a shot of Shanghai, which is a new city. About 300 skyscrapers have been built in Shanghai in the last 30 years. And that's Doha. 
in Qatar, another new city, another new skyline. It's not a mega city, but it's certainly impressive in its skyline. While we're on the Red Sea, uh, that's uh, Dubai, a very new skyline. And this is Hong Kong, which is a mega city. Seoul, South Korea, another one, and Singapore. So we're looking at the world today, and there's these huge agglomeration of agglomerations of human beings. Now, these truly are human uh, anthills. So how do we do this socially, given that we evolved and lived so long in hunting and gathering groups of five to fifty people? How did we adjust so quickly um, to the way that we're living now? Thank you for listening.